Welcome back to Historical American Girl Read Alouds. Today I have Josefina and her weaving loom that came from American Girl. And I'll show you how it was used after we read today. In today's chapter, you will hear a few things that we talked about in other videos that I want to remind you about before we begin reading. First, the chapter starts with Josefina rolling up her sheepskin and blankets when she wakes up. As you will recall from the last video, we talked about how Josefina would not have had an actual bed, just sheepskin and blankets on the floor. Here is the diagram of a rancho that we looked at earlier. You will see in this back bedroom here, there is a bed that looks like the one American Girl sold for Josefina, which I showed in another video. Remember, however, that this type of bed would only have been used by guests or elderly relatives. You'll hear Josefina talk about going through the small door within the large gate that is the only opening to the outside from inside the rancho, which we talked about in another video. And that would be here. You'll see a little picture of the door within a door in the text. In the chapter today, Josefina mentions several other rooms in the rancho. One room of her house would have contained a family altar, like in this picture. Belief in God was very important to the people of New Mexico, as were the Catholic saints. Almost every room in the rancho had santos, which are pictures or images of saints. Another room that is mentioned in chapter four is the weaving room. Here. In this picture, you can see what the weaving room might have looked like. Against the wall is the loom, which was used to weave rugs and blankets. It says up here, let's see if I can, Hold it so you can see it. <laughs> it says right up here that red dye was made from insects that lived on cactus plants. So that's how they made their wool red. The family used wool from the rancho's sheep to weave colorful blankets and rugs for their household, plus extras to trade. In the room over here, there are herbs and other plants being dried for dyes to color the wool and to be used for cooking and for medicine. This particular rancho diagram does not show a gran sala like the one that has been mentioned throughout the story, but I picture it looking a lot like uh, this room here, only probably a lot bigger because it held that dance, that party called the Fandango. I love how all of the rooms have beautiful, colorful blankets decorating the walls and rugs on the floors. These would have been made by Josefina and her sister and her mother and some of their servants. And when I build a rancho someday for my Josefina, I hope to decorate all the walls and floors of my rancho with bright blankets and rugs like the ones pictured here. Do you remember what a reboso is? You'll hear one mentioned in this text today. It was like a shawl or a wrap. This one is Josefina's rebozo, but you'll hear about a different one in chapter four. Lastly, you'll hear today that Josefina, her sisters, 
and her mother did not know how to read or write. We take for granted in our lives today that all children are sent to school and learn these skills. But back in New Mexico in 1824, there were no schools and children were too busy helping their families survive to have time for school anyway. Just imagine if you were never, even as an adult, able to read or write a note or a letter, never able to read directions about how to do something. Josefina's mother couldn't even write letters to her sister, Tia Dolores, living in Mexico City. The text says she had to dictate a letter to her sister, which means she had to tell someone else what words to write down. It is truly a valuable thing to be able to read and write, which people who lived long ago wished for. We're very blessed to have school for all children in our country. Josefina has to rise very early to start her many chores for the day. The text doesn't say exactly what time she wakes up, so see if you can figure out about what time she wakes up from the clues in the text as we read. As we left off in chapter three, Tia Dolores was going to help Josefina plant some more seeds in Mama's garden and try to save the plants Floricita had damaged. At the very end of the chapter, it said Josefina had just had an idea that had grown into a heartfelt hope. Let's find out what her hope is. Chapter four, Josefina's idea. Never had Josefina been more eager to begin a day. The next morning, she was up even earlier than usual. Quietly so that she wouldn't waken Francisca or Clara, Josefina rolled up the sheepskins and blankets that were her bed. She dressed and slipped outside. The moon hung low in the sky. It cast such a strong, pure light that everything was bathed in silver or shadow. Josefina went to the kitchen. Early as it was, Carmen was already there grinding corn for the morning meal. Her husband was starting the kitchen fire. Carmen nodded good morning to Josefina and handed her a water jar to fill at the stream, just as she did every morning. But this morning was different for Josefina. This was the morning of the day Tia Dolores was going to spend with her and her sisters. The huge front gate was closed, so Josefina stepped through the small door cut into the gate. She closed the door behind her and ran across the moon-washed ground to Abuelito's wagon. Standing on tiptoe, she looked in. There was the big crate with Tia Dolores's piano inside. Josefina poked her finger through a crack in the crate and touched the polished wood of the piano. She smiled when she remembered the pleasure its music had given her. Then she skipped down to the stream, thinking of the melody Tia Dolores had played. The tune stayed in her head as she did her early morning chores. She gathered eggs, singing it. She swept the courtyards, dancing to it. She piled wood next to the fireplaces in time to its rhythm. When the village church bell rang its call to prayers at seven o'clock, it seemed to ring along with the tune. And when the family said morning prayers together in front of the small altar in the family sala, dedicating their day's work to God, their voices seemed to rise and fall just as the piano notes had. The music seemed to be everywhere Everywhere, everywhere Josefina went. Tia Dolores did too. Tia Dolores was interested in everything. 
At breakfast, she said, I want to see as much of the rancho as I can today. So after breakfast, Josefina led Tia Dolores through the orchard, past the cornfields, and to the stream. They filled water jars and carried them up to water the kitchen garden. Then they picked some fat pumpkins for Tia Dolores to take home with her to Santa Fe the next day. I am sure my mother has no pumpkins as big as these in her garden, said Tia Dolores. Wherever she went, Tia Dolores found something to praise. Josefina led Tia Dolores to the weaving room. There, Clara showed her the sheep's wool she had carded, spun, and dyed. Tia Dolores admired the colors. There are no colors finer than these in all of Mexico, she said. Tia Dolores was a good teacher. She showed Clara a faster way to knit the heel on a sock. She showed Francisca how to sew a patch over a hole so that it hardly showed at all. Josefina was in the back courtyard clearing away the dead stems Florecita had trampled when Tia Dolores joined her. I've brought you some seeds to plant, she said to Josefina as she handed her a small package. Gracias, said Josefina. I'll help you for a while. Then I promised Anna I would make bread with her, said Tia Dolores. She began to dig holes in the soil for the seeds. Anna has lots of responsibilities, doesn't she? Yes, agreed Josefina. It's hard for Anna. Mama ran the household so smoothly, but Anna doesn't always know what to do, and Mama is not here to teach her. Anna is young, said Tia Dolores, as she covered some seeds with soil. It's a good thing she has you and Francisca and Clara to help her. Josefina nodded slowly. We try, she said, but sometimes... She stopped. Tia Dolores gave her a questioning look. Josefina sighed. She dug a little hole in the soil. You see, she said, Francisca and Clara fight a lot. They are so different. Clara is careful and practical, and Francisca is so quick and fiery. When Mama was alive, she put a stop to their arguments before they began. But now, well, Anna tries, but she is too soft-hearted, and they won't mind her. I try to joke them out of fighting. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Blessed are the peacemakers, said Tia Dolores softly, for they will be called the children of God. She smiled at Josefina. You know, she said, it's perfectly natural for sisters to disagree. You should have heard your mama and me sometimes. She was quite a few years older than I was. I am sure she thought I was a miserable pest. I wanted to be like her. Once, I wore her best sash without her permission, and I lost it. Your mama was very angry. She wouldn't speak to me for days, but she finally forgave me. Josefina realized suddenly, Tia Dolores misses her sister. She misses mama too, just as much as we do. She said, I wish you could be here to protect these flowers from Florecita when they bloom. I'd love to see the flowers, said Tia Dolores, but you can protect them from Florecita. You aren't afraid of her anymore. You don't need me. You will make your mama's flowers bloom again and keep them safe, Josefina. I know you will. Oh, Tia Dolores, it's beautiful, said Anna. She draped a silk reboso over her shoulders. Its colors were as bright as flowers. Gracias. It was early afternoon, just after the midday meal. Anna, Francisca, Clara, and Josefina were gathered in the family sala. 
Tia Dolores had called them together. She had presents for them all. Francisca, said Tia Dolores, this is a sewing diary I made for you. She gave Francisca a little hand, handmade book. These are sketches of dresses in it and samples of material and notes about how to make the dresses. Gracias, said Francisca. Eagerly, she looked at the sewing diary. The dresses are so elegant, Tia Dolores, she said. I wish you could be here to help us make them. She looked up and joked, I'm afraid I will sew a sleeve on upside down. <laughs> the notes and directions will help you, said Tia Dolores. Francisca looked doubtful, but I can't read, she said. None of us can. Oh, said Tia Dolores. Well then, just use your good sense. I am sure if you and your sisters help each other, you will do very well. For Clara, Tia Dolores had brought a fine pair of scissors and some sewing needles. Clara was very pleased because her gift was beautiful and useful. And this is for you, Josefina, said Tia Dolores. She handed Josefina a necklace, a small dark red stone surrounded by gold hung from a delicate chain. Josefina smiled. The necklace was lovely. Gracias, Tia Dolores, she said. Her hands were shaky with excitement as she put the necklace on. My, said Francisca, isn't that necklace quite grown up? Yes, indeed it is, said Tia Dolores firmly. And isn't Josefina quite grown up too? Francisca said no more. Tia Dolores, said Anna, how did you know what would be the perfect gift for each one of us? Tia Dolores smiled. All the years I lived in Mexico City, I looked forward to the caravans coming, she said. I knew Abuelito would bring stories about all of you and your life here on the rancho. Sometimes he would bring a letter dictated by your mama. I felt as if I were watching you grow up even though I was far away. When I decided to come home, I enjoyed thinking about what present to bring each of you. Well, said Anna, I'm sorry we didn't know that you were coming. We have nothing to give you in return for your gifts. Oh, laughed Tia Dolores, this day with you is all the gift I want. When the afternoon had cooled into early evening, Tia Dolores and Abuelita walked to the village. They wanted to say a prayer at Mama's grave. They were also going to visit Papa's oldest sister who lived in the village. Josefina and her sisters sat in a corner of the front courtyard that was still warm from the heat of the day's sun. Every now and then they could hear Anna's little boys laughing with Carmen in the kitchen nearby. The sisters were peeling back the husks from roasted ears of corn. They were going to braid the husks together to make a long string of ears so that the corn could be hung out to dry. Josefina said, hasn't it been nice today having Tia Dolores here? Yes, said Anna. She was such a help to me and she was so kind to my little boys. Tia Dolores is a very sensible, hardworking person, said Clara. That was her highest praise. Oh, Clara, protested Francisca. You make her sound as dull as these ears of corn. I found her to be elegant and graceful. Josefina decided the time had come to tell her sisters her idea. She picked up an ear of corn and peeled the husk slowly. What if, she said quietly, we asked Tia Dolores to stay? No one said anything. 
they were all too surprised. Josefina went on. She could help us and teach us the way she did today. She wouldn't say stay, said Francisca. She's used to life in Mexico City, where there are lots of grand people and grand houses. She doesn't want to live on a rancho. But she said she always loved to hear about the rancho when Abuelito came to visit her, remember? said Josefina. And she doesn't act fancy or put on airs. She likes it here. She was interested in everything. Yes, said Anna, but I think perhaps she has come home hoping to get married and start a family of her own. She's not too old for that, you know. She wouldn't have to stay here forever, said Josefina, just for a few months. And anyway, she is our aunt. We are her family. Clara picked up several ears of corn and put them in her lap. Well, she said in her flat, no-nonsense manner, even if Tia Dolores would be willing to stay, it wouldn't be proper for us to ask her. Papa would have to approve of the idea. He would have to be the one to ask her to stay. Josefina's heart sank. She hadn't thought of that. She knew Clara was right. Who wants to be the one to present the idea to Papa? Clara asked. I certainly don't. She turned to Josefina. It's your idea, she said. Do you want to talk to Papa about it? Josefina looked down at the ear of corn in her hands. No, she said in a small voice. Will you go to him, Anna? Clara asked. You are the oldest. Oh, I couldn't, said Anna. Papa might think I was complaining. If I say that I need Tia Dolores' help, he might think I don't want to do what is my responsibility to do. Oh, said, exclaimed Francisca. She stood up and brushed off her skirt. I'm not afraid to talk to Papa. I'll just march right up to him and say, Papa, you must ask Tia Dolores to stay. Anna, Clara, and Josefina looked at each other. They knew that was not at all the right way to speak to Papa. It wasn't that Papa was stern or cold, but he was the patron, the head of the rancho and the head of their family. The girls had never presented such an important idea to him before. It would have to be done politely and with respect. Wait, Francisca, said Josefina. She stood up too. I think all of us should speak to Papa. We should go together. That way, Papa will see that all four of us would like Tia Dolores to stay. Anna and Clara didn't move. Come on, said Josefina. She grinned. Don't worry, I'll do the talking if you don't want to. Last night, I had the courage to stand up to Florecita. Papa is much, much kinder than she is. The sisters found Papa near the animal pens. He was tightening the latch on the gate. He smiled when he saw Josefina. The latch is stronger now, he said. We shouldn't have any more goats in Mama's flowers. That's good, said Josefina. She swallowed. Francisca gave her a little shove forward. Papa, Josefina said, may we ask you something? Papa looked at the four girls. Yes, he said. Do you think, Josefina said carefully, that you could ask Tia Dolores to stay here with us for a while? Ask her to stay, repeated Papa. Yes, said Josefina, not forever, just for a while. She could help us and she could teach us the way, the way Mama did. Please, would you ask her? Josefina saw a look of sadness cross Papa's face. He turned away. I'll consider it, he said. But Papa, 
Francisca blurted. You must! Josefina tugged on Francisca's sleeve and frowned at her to make her stop talking. Gracias, papa, said Josefina. She hesitated and then she added, we need Tia Dolores. Then she and her sisters left. What do you think papa will do? Francisco whispered. She and Clara and Josefina were in their sleeping sala getting ready for bed. Do you think he will speak to Tia Dolores? I don't know, said Josefina. I hope so. And if he does ask her, what do you think she will say? Francisca wondered aloud. Josefina sighed. I don't know, she said again. I think you're silly to wonder about it, Clara said. We'll find out tomorrow. Abuelita and the caravan will leave first thing in the morning. Tia Dolores will either leave with him or not. We'll just have to wait and see. Oh, I hate waiting, said Francisca. The three sisters smiled at each other. They all hated to wait. On that, they certainly agreed. The next morning, they were up early. Even Francisca, who was usually slow getting dressed, was ready and waiting with Ana Clara and Josefina next to Abuelito's wagon. They watched the servants load Abuelito's small trunk onto the wagon. Then, with sinking hearts, the sisters saw Tia Dolores's trunk loaded onto the wagon as well. Papa didn't ask her, Francisco groaned. Or maybe he did and she said no, said Anna. She doesn't want to stay, Clara added. Josefina was so disappointed she couldn't talk. A lump rose in her throat when she heard Papa and Tia Dolores and Abuelito coming. Suddenly, Josefina didn't want to stand there by the wagon one second longer. She couldn't bear to kiss Tia Dolores and Abuelito goodbye. Without a murmur, she slipped away back inside the house. She went to the Gran Sala because it was the only room that was sure to be empty. As she walked into the cool darkness of the Gran Sala, she remembered how it had looked the night of the Fandango, full of life and music. Now there was nothing but shadows. Just then, in a corner of the room, Josefina saw a large, dark shape. She caught her breath when she saw what it was. It was Tia Dolores' piano! Instantly, Josefina knew what that meant. Tia Dolores would never have left her piano unless... Josefina flew across the courtyard and out the front gate so fast it seemed as if she had wings on her feet. Tia Dolores caught her in her arms. There you are, Josefina, Tia Dolores said. I wanted to say goodbye to you. Josefina pulled back and looked at Tia Dolores' face. I'm going to Santa Fe, Tia Dolores said. I'm going to see my dear mamma, whom I have not seen for 10 years, but then I'll come back. When? asked Josefina. Tia Dolores laughed. Soon, she said, and when I come back, I'll stay as long as you need me. Josefina hugged Tia Dolores hard. Then Tia Dolores swung herself up on the wagon. Well, 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 said Abuelito. He pretended to be cross. Now it seems that if I want to see Dolores, I'm going to have to come here and see all of you girls too. What a bother, what a bother, he sighed. At least I don't have to carry that piano with me today. Though if we meet up with any thieves, I'll just have to frighten them off with my singing, I suppose. Then he kissed Josefina and her sisters goodbye and gave them his blessing. Adios, Abuelito, called all the girls as the wagon pulled away. Adios, Tia Dolores. Come back soon, Josefina sang out as she waved goodbye. 
As soon as the wagon was out of sight, Josefina hurried back inside. She went to the kitchen to get a jar. She wanted to fill the jar with water to sprinkle on Mama's flowers. Tia Dolores will be back soon, she thought. I want the flowers to be beautiful when she returns. Josefina set off for the stream, whistling Tia Dolores' tune. And that's the end of chapter four. Next time, we will read the last section of the book called A Peek into the Past, which tells some of the true facts and information about what life was like during Josefina's time. But before I go today, I am going to show you how to weave on this loom. So I'm going to show you how to actually weave on the loom that comes from American Girl. It comes with a book of instructions and it's actually a Navajo weaving loom. The Navajos were a group of Indians in the Southwest that lived near Santa Fe where Josefina lived. So it tells us in the directions that Josefina learned to weave on a Navajo loom like the one you will use. Teresita, a Navajo woman in Josefina's household, was the one who taught Josefina how to weave blankets for trading. Traditionally, the first blanket a Navajo girl would learn to weave was striped, like the one that the directions are for here. Both Spanish weavers and Indian weavers made beautiful blankets to use, sell, or trade. They used wool from sheep they raised themselves. After the wool was cut from the sheep, it was washed, spun, and dyed to use as yarn for weaving. And we've talked about some of that already in our, um, in our stories. So the loom here has a big frame around the outside, and that's the part that stays permanent where this section here, when you were done weaving, weaving would come off. Um, in our little American Girl model, we have to clamp it to a table. Now the real one, like the one you saw in the picture today, was so big and heavy that it didn't have to be clamped down. It was a giant thing in the room and sat on the floor, and so that would be too heavy for it to, to move much. But this one has to be clamped to the table. Um, these little strings here are called the warp. You may have done some weaving at some time in your life before, and you might have had, maybe if you did some weaving on paper or something, there might have been paper strips. But these are the, called the warp. The yarn that goes in, that goes from side to side, this yarn here, is called the weft. That's its official name. They just decided to call it yarn in the directions so it wouldn't be too confusing. And yarn is what they provide you. It's, it's not real wool. It's like yarn you could find at a craft store. So I wish it was wool. I, I think it would have a little bit more traditional colors. This is just a little bit bright and bold for what Josefina's rugs would have looked like, like the ones we've seen in the pictures. But this is what we have. So this is the shuttle. And it's a tool that holds the yarn. So instead of taking just one piece of yarn and pushing it in and out with your fingers, this tool helps you to have more yarn go through at once. So it would usually be full of yarn. I don't have a whole lot on it right here, but you would wind the yarn around and then back behind that little piece there. Um, and then that's what you'll see goes in and out of the loom as we go along. Then this little tool here is called the fork, which is what it looks like. <laughs> and it's used to push the rows of wool together tightly. This flat wooden stick is called the batten. And it was used to hold open spaces, which are called sheds, in the warp for the yarn to be pulled through. So I'll show you how that holds open the spaces in a moment. Uh, this 
is called the shed rod. It's a stick that holds some of the, the um, pieces of yarn or the warp out, where this part here is called the heddle rod. And you notice it's got like little pieces of string wrapped around, and it actually pulls forward different strings. The shed rod holds the second string here out, and this, the heddle rod, pulls out the first and third strings. So it pulls out different strings. I think the hardest thing so far that I've had when I've been um, trying out this loom here is you have to break the yarn. Instead of cutting it with scissors like we would normally do, um, you have to pull it and break it because that makes it so that the yarn clings to the next end. If you cut it with scissors, it won't um, cling, but somehow when like the next piece gets put over the top of it, they cling together when they're, when they are ripped like that. So those are the basics. You can see I've already kind of started here. Um, so on this last row that I did, here's my yarn coming out here. I was over this string here. And if you've ever done weaving before, you know you have to go over, under, over, under. So when I put my, um, my shuttle, I keep forgetting what this one's called. When I put my shuttle through, this time I wanna go behind that first string and over the top of this one. So what I need to do here is I need to look and see which one of these pulls forward this first string. And that happens to be the heddle yard, the heddle rod. So when I pull this out, you can see it pulls out this string here. So once I pull that out, I can slip the batten behind the strings that it is pulling out. So you can see this pulls every other string. If you've ever done weaving before, you had to you know, go in and out and in and out. But this tool, when you twist it, makes a nice big open space. So I can take the shuttle and I can just put it through like that. Once it gets to this point, you want to make sure it's not too tight on this end, otherwise it pulls the blanket together in the middle. Instead of making it rectangular, it gets all squished in the middle. So you have to make sure it stays loose there. And they tell you to kind of use your needle here to make some scallops. That also helps it to not be too tight. And then you take your fork and you press it down. You want to keep pressing it down tightly enough that these little strings get hidden. And you can see through the bottom of my blanket here that you can't see those anymore. Some of these will have to be tightened a bit more because you can see some of the white peeking through. But as I go along, I'll keep pushing them down so that it covers it. All right, so I got that one through. Now I can take the batten out and I used the heddle rod that time to pull strings forward but now I want to pull the other strings forward. I want to pull this one forward. So now I use my shed rod. Now this one's a little bit trickier I think because you've got the heddle rod in the way. But if you pull that forward, pull it forward, Stick the batten in and then twist it so it holds it open and kind of move that out of the way. And so now I can put it behind and then through. Slide it through. Sometimes your batten slips you have to open it back up. And if you've got a lot of yarn on your shuttle here, it can be hard to push it through sometimes. This red stripe is pretty narrow, so I don't have a whole lot of yarn on there right now. And kind of pull it through. Make sure it's not too tight on that end. Make your little 
scallop so it's not pulled too tight. And then push the whole thing down. And that's basically it. So back and forth, pulling the opposite strings out with the shed rod and the heddle rod, holding it open with the batten. When you run, come to the end of a color here, like when I would run out and be ready to change my other color, I would just wind the new color around the shuttle and I would start the new end right over the top of the old red and it, the ends should cling together because they were ripped instead of cut. So it's a long process <laughs> to make a whole rug. You can imagine how much time it took for them to make blankets the size that would fit on beds or walls or rugs on the floor. This one is supposed to be just about the size to cover up a doll, not a Josefina doll, but a doll for Josefina. So it's gonna be pretty small when it's done. But I think it's pretty neat to be able to learn traditional Navajo weaving. This is exactly how they do it. It's just in a miniature version. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about American Girl is how accurate they are to how things really were, as accurate as they can be. So thank you so much for joining me for chapter four of Meet Josefina. Join me next time for some more facts about life at the time of Josefina as we read the last section in the book, A Peek into the Past. Thank you.